Hello and welcome to another episode of Archery Releases Ad Nauseum, and today I'm going to talk about the new for 2024 Evolution Outdoors Ibex. This release is not to be confused with the Scott Archery Ibex, which is a patented thumb release design from the 2010s that I don't think made it into production. There was also a Scott Ibex hinge made to match the thumb, and I think that one made it into production, but I've only seen one photo of a single one and I've never handled one, so it must not have been that popular. Anyway, I digress. As usual, this review will be formatted like a long-form video essay or podcast, so it will most likely be my face with some accompanying visuals and some b-roll of me using it while I talk over it. So if you want to pop in a set of earbuds and listen to this while you do something else, you will not be missing much. There will be time codes in the description for individual segments. Disclaimer, I bought this release with my own money. I am not sponsored or affiliated with Evolution Outdoors or any other competing company, so there is nothing keeping me from expressing my honest opinion about this product. There are things I like and things I don't like, and I'm going to be giving suggestions to Evolution Outdoors during the course of the video on what I think could be improved. I am planning on offering holsters for these on Etsy and on my website in case anyone is interested in patronizing my business after you've finished hearing what I've had to say about them, and I will have these up on my sizing guide as soon as I have a chance to scan them and process them. As a first run of this product, or any products in general that first come into the market, there may be things that are a little off when you go from prototype to production model. The amount of issues is going to depend on where it's made and how closely the people in charge of quality control can monitor or the manufacturers, that is if it's not made in-house on your own machines. Evolution Outdoors displays on their website that their products are made in the USA, so that's one better than a certain other company who claims designed and built in the USA. According to the Federal Trade Commission, made in USA means that all or virtually all the product has been made in America. That is, all significant parts, processing, and labor that go into the product must be of US origin. For the moment, and hopefully the foreseeable future, that is indicative of a higher degree of quality as well as better quality control over something that was manufactured overseas and then imported and assembled here. You guys know who I'm talking about. That being said, the cost of the Ibex is $300 for the aluminum versions and $350 for the brass. This puts them in the highest price bracket for release aids and, now that I think about it, more expensive than comparable offerings from the top names in the industry. So if a company is going to ask a premium price for their product, that product should be able to satisfy premium expectations. Evolution Outdoors is known for manufacturing broadheads of various designs and this is their first foray into producing a release aid. They made a point in their marketing to show the release as something that is not only different but also packs a feature set that rivals and surpasses most of their hinges. They even put a chart on their website that shows all the things their releases do versus what traditional hinges do and don't do. I'll cover those a little bit later and examine their relevance. Some of the line items they had are just padding, or they don't mean what they think they mean. The Ibex is a hinge or back tension release, but instead of an open hook and a head that pivots on top of the release's neck, the Ibex has a closing jaw and it pivots inside the handle. They towed it as the first hinge to have its pivot positioned in this fashion, but that title technically goes to the Trueball HBX. The Ibex is the only hinge on the market that can be locked onto a D-loop. Again, it's not the first one to be able to do this. Stan had caliper-jawed hinges in the past. However, the Ibex is the only one currently in production. The pivot being inside the handle is supposed to improve consistency by having the jaw remain stationary while the handle pivots around it, and I'm going to get back to that later. This hinge is geared towards hunting between its ability to hang on a D-loop as well as its spring-loaded neck and jaw, so you don't have the issues of a loose head rattling around like most other hinges with the exception of the HTs, HBCs, and Cobra Professional, which is this one, which is... I really wish they would come out with a click version of this, because it's kind of cool, it's all stainless steel and everything's spring-loaded. Anyway, I don't know the size of the market in terms of hunters who would use a hinge, but 3D archery is booming, and I think this would be right at home at TAC or on a local course. That is, if it fits your style. The one thing they also mention in there is that while it it is able to attach to a D-loop, you don't want to walk around with it this way because it can fall off. So if you hunt from a tree stand, it's a good idea to, you can hang it off your loop until you're ready, but they don't recommend you walking around the woods with this and shaking it around for the reasons that I just demonstrated. So there are other places I can recommend you put it, and not in a vulgar fashion, but I'll work on that and I'll post the links to my Etsy shop. 
The release comes in a zipper case with a thumb peg attachment piece, an aluminum thumb peg, lanyard attachment piece, and two Allen keys. It also comes with a few stickers and a single sheet of paper that constitutes the instructions. The zipper case has a foam insert that holds the release securely. It's a nice touch, but the insert is missing cutouts, so you can put the release back in the case with the thumb peg assembly and or the lanyard attachment point installed, or with the finger attachment in any position other than fully swept back. So if you use the Ibex in any way except just like this, then the case is no longer going to be usable unless you modify the foam insert or just pull it out and throw the release in unsecured. So you'd have to just throw it in like that. So my first suggestion to Evolution Outdoors is to instruct whomever makes these inserts, unless you make them yourself, to make sure it is cut in a fashion where the release can be inserted fully assembled and with the finger attachment in different positions. So unless you're planning on using this as just a, just for the presentation when you buy it, um, it's not. It also doesn't. Um, it also doesn't fit right in with the jaw closed. So you actually have to close the jaw in order for it to fit in there as well. So. That's suggestion number one. The Ibex is available in three colors, green Cerakoted aluminum, gray Cerakoted aluminum, and a stone wash-ish brass. The finger attachment is black anodized aluminum, unless that's Cerakoted as well, and the head and jaw are made of stainless steel. The attachment piece for the thumb peg is black anodized aluminum and is attached to the spine of the release by removing one of these very small bolts holding the case together and inserting the tab into a slot machined into the back of the handle. It has three threaded holes to set the thumb peg in three different positions. When installed, it's not going to go anywhere, but it has play and it rattles in its mounting hole. I may also be overestimating the potential stressors that will be placed on this piece and the screw that's holding it in place, which looks like a 440 thread pitch, but this doesn't seem like a particularly robust design. I can envision myself being able to grab this piece and then twisting it off, or at the very least torquing on the thumb peg while drawing the bow and damaging the threads on the bolt holding it in place. Or it might bend if I drop it on the thumb peg, which I'm apt to do because I become a clumsy bastard when I'm trying to maintain an air of intensity. If these screws were thicker, I would be less wary of their durability. The thumb peg attachment piece is also about one-sixth of the thickness of the handle, so a third of the thumb peg ends up sitting over the back of the handle and is not usable. There is still enough sticking out to get your thumb over it, but this kind of has the look of an afterthought as opposed to something that was designed from the beginning. This arrangement makes it impossible to install a larger aftermarket thumb peg if that's something you would like to do. So my next suggestion for Evolution Outdoors is to make this piece thicker so it sits flush on one side of the handle. You don't have to have it the entire width of the handle, just make it on one side and make it reversible and secure it to the release with a thicker screw. Or you could just add threaded holes to the side of the handle like most other release manuals manufacturers. So this feature needs a tweak, in my opinion. The way it is now, it looks like it was contrived as a means of doing lip service to the archers who use a thumb peg on their hinges, which is actually a fairly substantial portion. It's actually probably most of them. I would also add the photos on the website show this piece to be silver, and the one that I received was black, so I would update the photos on your website. I don't personally care that it's a different color, but I know there are people out there who might take greater umbrage with its the discrepancy between between what they received and what's on the website. So continuity is a good idea. Now that I've said all that, I found having a thumb peg on this release is actually pretty pointless due to the angle and position of the head. Look, check out my other videos for my uh, perspective on that. So fix it or don't fix it. The lanyard attachment point is a small piece of aluminum with holes drilled in both ends, one of which is inserted into another small slot cut into the back of the release after you remove the bolt that runs through it. My next question, which is probably yours, as you look at this has to be, what exactly are we supposed to do with this? The hole is too small for D-loop cord and way too small for 550 paracord. So what lanyard do you have in mind for us to use with this attachment? So next suggestion is, this hole needs to be flared out on one end and make the hole larger to at least run either 275 or 550 paracord through it. There are camera lanyards that have really small cable that could go through this, but I'm not running to a camera shop to get a lanyard for this. So I don't know... I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. You're you're saying you have a lanyard attachment, and then this is the piece that you've provided. It's not usable. 
I assume this was intentional based on how well it fits into this spot, but the thumb pig attachment piece also installs into the slot for the lanyard attachment piece, so it puts the peg in a far more usable position than is shown on the website. So if you can't reach it or use it properly in the position where it's supposed to go, which is out here, then you have another option. The aluminum third finger has three set positions that range from right about there, so relatively straight to swept to very swept. So there's no extra straight position like the releases with sweep adjustable handles that slide on a track instead of having three specific holes. That said, it should satisfy most people's needs for adjustability. There is no four finger option at this time, and while the handle is actually machined in a way that would make it a very nice two finger release, the ring finger attachment is captured at its pivot point and cannot be removed without splitting the two halves of the handle. So my next suggestion would be make the finger attachment removable. Sorry, that's my furnace over there. The finger beds are fairly thick, so they spread the force of the draw across a greater surface area of your fingers and make for a pretty comfortable draw. They round themselves smoothly without a defined flat down the center, and the handle is straight with no step down or taper. Now, if you're an archer who prefers a hinge where the neck of the release is thinner and doesn't spread the middle and index finger significantly, you are not going to like the Ibex. It splits the middle and index finger more than most of my thumb releases. The Ibex is available in two sizes, small slash medium and medium slash large. This is the medium slash large. From the technical diagram and instructions on their website, the index finger bed is the only thing that is different between the two sizes. The instructions are to measure the thickness of your index finger to decide which size you need. When it comes to something we're meant to hold in our hands, sizing is rather important, and offering two sizes where the only difference is the size of the index finger is lazy. People with different sized hands don't have the same size middle, ring, and pinky fingers, and different sized index fingers. So if a company is going to offer a release in two sizes, the handles should be actually distinct from each other. All the finger beds should be sized differently along with the finger attachment. Companies should not be half-assing the size on a $300 to $350 release and pretend they are offering variety. At this price point, it should be full ass or nothing. I hope no one clips that sentence and uses it out of context. Ultraview is the direct competition in this price range. They offer two sizes, and they are drastically different. Most people fit into the medium, and they made a large for guys with giant mitts. You could do it that way, or have one that fits most people's hands and then make a mini similarly to what Carter does to cater to children, women, or guys like me who have little midget fingers. Either way, your sizing on the Ibex is off and needs to be adjusted. So to compare the Ibex to the rest of the market, at least the ones that offer multiple sizes, the sizing on the Ibex runs large, and the small medium is going to be the equivalent of an extra large Stan Onyx or a large True Ball. The medium large Ibex is the same, but with a wider index finger and matches up to an XXL Onyx. So the Ibex is not geared towards people like myself with smaller hands. Here's a release that fits my hand with a little room to spare, and this is the Ibex. The feeling of going from a release that is well fitted to my hand, like the Stan Lynx, to something like the Ibex is very noticeable. And to sum it up, make a long story short, you made these too big. The click and speed are independently adjustable, and setting them is neither the easiest nor the most difficult. They are adjusted at the back of the handle, and the contact points where the hook and the sears meet are contained within the handle, so you're not able to visually observe how they interact when you adjust something like you can with a typical hinge. With this, I can just look at it and go, okay, well the moon's here. If I move the moon up, the hook's going to slide along more of it, and if I move it down, then it's going to slide along less of it. You can't really see, well, you can't see it at all with the Ibex. The instructions that are included with the Ibex read as follows. With the sear closer to this edge, the sear is more engaged, thus slower. In this position, the hook will be on the silver sear drawing and drop to the black sear, click, then fire. That's the only information you get in the package in terms of adjustment, and it comes on a single printed sheet of paper in black and white with a picture that's kind of hard to see of the back of the release. There are videos on YouTube from Evolution Outdoors explaining the adjustment process in further detail. I think there should be more detailed instructions included with the release. I can envision somebody reading the two sentences that comprise the instructions and then going, what the fuck does that mean?
The click and speed sears are L-shaped and contained in this little slot here and have grub screws on both ends of them. An adjustment consists of loosening one side while tightening the other. So you're rocking those pieces on a pivot pin until you get the alignment you need. You pivot them towards the ring finger to make the release slower and toward the index finger to make it faster. To fine tune it, you loosen the side toward where you need to adjust the speed and then snug it down by tightening the screw on the other side. I just explained it way more saliently than the instructions that were provided. The sears are micro adjusted by way of a 35 thousandth inch wrench. I cannot help but ask why a company would choose to have their parts machined in a way that would require a tool that is one, not commonly available, and two, really really easy to misplace. If you just make those parts a little bigger and put a set screw in there that takes a 50 thousandth, then the customer wouldn't need to keep tabs on this tiny ass wrench, and they would have the tools already available to them because most folding key sets already go down to 50 thousandth. I made the same criticism of Trueball with our executive and executive flex, and I think the Carter Total Control and Too Smooth use a 35 thousandth wrench as well. So this release and those fail my criteria of only needing hex keys found on the folding key sets that run from 50 thousandth to 3 sixteenths, which are the ones that most of us carry already. The click itself is more of a speed bump than it is a click, and it's louder when you roll back over it to let down than it is when you're using it during the shot process. So making it possible to reset your shot without letting down also makes the click very dull and almost inaudible, which is apparently something that they were going for. I don't know if that's good or not. It also twangs your string a little bit when you slide over it, but ultimately it's something that is more tactile than it is audible, so you have to feel for it as opposed to listening for it. I'm gonna try and get it on, on audio. So, that's the click. That's the reset. That's the click. Reset. That's it. Ultimately, the Ibex is geared towards hunters, so having an inaudible click kind of makes sense. It's also marketed as a release where if you have to let down and you use a click, you can rotate back over the click and let down more safely, as opposed to other uh, hinges where you basically ride the click all the way down to brace. I will be interested to see if that produces any wear on the contact surfaces over time going up and over the click. However, I don't think mine's going to get to that point because I don't let down very often. I'm one of those guys who's stubborn enough to try and make it work even if things go wrong from the start. Like if I draw and hit the click too early, I figure this is a good time as any to test out a new firing engine and see how well I can improvise. That said, we've all suffered the occasional midwit who decides to walk the 3D course backwards and you have to call a ceasefire. I really wish that I just made that up. I, I didn't. So closing the jaw on the Ibex is easy. You can either grab the head, or actually you could pinch it between your fingers and close it that way, or you can just press up with your middle finger to lock the jaw. So D-loop hookup is very easy, and if you accidentally close it while knocking your arrow, you just have to flick it to uh, snap the jaw back open. That does create noise, so if you're out hunting, you're going to want to be careful about that or get it hooked onto your D-loop and just kind of hanging, unless you're walking around because it will fall off. The head angle and pivot point on this, and if you want more information on my perspective on this, check out one of my other videos on, um, on hinge head angles and why they're important. But the head and pivot point on the Ibex make it for a very cold release, and if you try to get your thumb on the peg or draw this thing with any kind of forward angle on the ring finger, it will require a lot of time and rotation to get the shot to break. So with my method of shot execution, where I draw with mostly my thumb and index finger, I don't have a peg on it right now, then let go of the peg and relax my fingers while spreading my arms, it doesn't work, and I get stuck, and I can't get it to go off, and I either have to let down and reset, or just grip it and rip it, as I'll show with the, vi with the videos that I'm probably playing right now. When I set the thumb peg to the, to the position for the lanyard attachment point, it's a little bit better, but it would really seem that this release is designed to be drawn with no thumb peg at all. So I took the Ibex to the range after attempting to set it up the way I prefer setting up a hinge, which is with my wrist mostly locked forward and my thumb on the peg. This way requires the sears to be set very hot, and I think I draw this way for the same reason the grip angle on some handguns are set up the way they are. So like a Glock or Steyr where the grip is angled where you have to lock your wrist forward to align the sights, 
I'm locking my wrist out in the other direction when I draw the bow with a hinge. That's how I do it, and I expect my equipment to be able to be adjusted to accommodate this draw style. My equipment works for me, I don't work for it. So similarly to the Ultraview hinges, the Ibex is designed to require more even finger pressure and minimal forward angle on the ring finger in order to induce enough rotation to get the head to start to move and release the hook. So if you draw the way I do, you can run out of arm expansion before the head rotates enough to release the jaw, and that was the issue I was having when I took it to the range. I would push forward and pull back, then get stuck and then just grab a handful of it to force it to go off. Also, while I was there, I noticed the point of impact was about a foot to the left of my stand links at 20 yards due to the jaw sitting out further uh, to my right when anchored. So it pulls the string out away from your face and moves the point of impact in the opposite direction. So if you're right-handed, your point of impact is going to move left, and if you're left-handed, your point of impact is going to move to the right because it's your string is anchored out further away from your face, despite having your knuckles in the same spot. So in order for me to be able to use this release, I needed to set the sears much colder and draw like I'm drawing a thumb release with the handle perpendicular to the arrow. When I do that, I can pull through and get the jaw to release with some effort. So if you already have a set method you like to draw your hinges, then it may require you to modify your form to be able to use it effectively. That being said, if you are learning a hinge for the first time, or your preference is to pull with even finger pressure, then this will actually be a good candidate. It's very easy to draw when you draw it the way it needs to be drawn. Just one way of saying it. As for me, between that and the size of the handle, I'm going to be sticking with my links and executive flex. While aesthetics are subjective, I wouldn't exactly call this the most elegant looking of designs. It definitely falls into the form-fitting function category of releases. If you're into the brutalist style, then it might be your cup of tea in terms of looks. So despite its utilitarian appearance, the fit and finish are pretty good. The stonewash finish on the brass is consistent, and there are no burrs or sharp edges on the handle. The head has find edges, but they are smooth and not abrasive. The stainless head has a machined finish with some light tooling marks still visible. They're subtle, but they are there. However, the Ibex is geared towards Hunter, so I wouldn't expect the stainless head to be mirror polished. The jaw is polished, though, and it should be to prevent it from eating RD loops. I will say, too, uh, that I just noticed while I was doing this that the sides of the casing are a little bit off. So it's a two-piece handle, and it runs the seam straight down the middle, and the index finger, the two pieces where the index finger are a little bit off and out of alignment. So the machining on, on the heads here, like this, this piece here on the front here, needs to be twisted a little bit this way in order to get it to match up. So they aren't perfectly matched, and that's something they should probably take a look at and clean up. The Ibex logo is laser etched on the side of the release. Hey, that's a good thing. That's probably going to be my thumbnail. And it looks like they knew what they were doing. It doesn't have any areas on it that are lighter or darker, and it's on a flat slab, so there's no reason why the laser would lose focus. So I have no complaints in this category. I will be interested to see how they did with the Cerakote on the aluminum models. The quality of Cerakote is highly dependent on who is doing it, and there are still good Cerakote jobs and bad ones, sometimes from the same company. So before I close out, I mentioned earlier a chart Evolution Outdoors posted on their website showing what the Ibex can do over other traditional hinges. So I'm going to go over it line by line to gauge their assessment of their product. First line is the Ibex locks on a D-loop while other hinges don't. That's true. I have nothing to add to it, so moving on. So next point, caliper style string retention on the Ibex and not on other hinges. So this has a closable side opening jaw as opposed to a hook. This is a different way of saying it locks on a D-loop. So it's mostly padding unless you factor in that a traditional hinge technically opens in a more linear fashion because the string pulls the hook open once it slips off the moon. If you believe what Trueball says about the Trident and Ultimate Flex, a release with a hook that is pulled open has a more consistent point of impact when held at different angles. The Ibex releases the string by moving its jaw out of the way of the D-loop, which can, according to Trueball, create a little variance from the D-loop slipping around the jaw. Does it actually make a difference? Probably not one any of us will be able to notice, but it's good for marketing or convincing people that your design is better than others. In this case, Trueball says it's bad, Evolution Outdoors says it's good. Next point, the Ibex is resettable after the click. This is true, and no other hinge I know of can do that. However, it comes with the trade-off of the click not being audible and being less defined. Again, it's a speed bump more than, say, the seam between two pieces 
pieces of concrete. Next point, almost zero audible click. I don't know why that's a selling point that your click is harder to notice. So the next bullet point is the head pivots in the handle and that makes it easier to rotate the handle around the head. That is true, but the way they market its benefits is also how every hinge works. You rotate the handle around the hinge's head, or that's how they're supposed to work. So it's not exactly unique. It's a different mousetrap. Detachable thumb peg assembly. That's true. I don't know how that's beneficial because most really most releases have their thumb pegs just drilled into a threaded hole in the side of their handle. So they have a detachable thumb peg assembly as well. And then the more complex ones like the Stan Links, you can actually undo those or loosen those screws and take this entire assembly off. So not super unique, but it is, I guess it's a selling point. The Ibex has a lanyard connection and they are correct in that some hinges do and some do not. The Ibex technically has one, though I'm still not sure what I'm supposed to use with this piece. The Ibex has micro-adjustable sears, that is true, and some hinges have it and some other hinges don't. 100% made in the USA. They put maybe for other hinges. I'm assuming they main releases from American companies because there are release manufacturers in other countries. However, I wonder who they mean when they say maybe. So in conclusion, I think they came up with something unique in the Ibex, and in execution, it can work for some but not everyone. That said, the only two specifically notable things that this release can do that other hinges can't is lock onto a D-loop and then reset after the click. So if those things are useful to you, your style of drawing and shot execution is more on the colder side, and this release fits your hand, then it is worth giving a try. But those are my thoughts, let me know yours in the comments. Until next time, take care, stay safe, and happy hunting. So this is a recap of the suggestions I made during the video for Evolution Outdoors for their convenience, since I know they will watch this. Number one, more cutouts in the foam for the case so you can reinsert the release in different configurations. Number two, thicker case screws. Number three, make the thumb peg attachment flush with the side of the case or drill threaded holes in the side of the handle. Number four, update the photos on your website to make sure the product being shipped matches the photos on the website. Number five, make a lanyard attachment that actually accepts lanyards. Number six, make the finger attachment removable so those who want to use it as a two finger can do so. Number seven, make your sears thicker so they can accept a set screw that takes a 50 thousandth or larger allen key. Number eight, different sizing. Make a regular and a mini if you're going to offer two sizes. Specifically take the small medium, make that your regular size, and then reduce the size by 10% and call it the mini. Number nine, fix the QC and alignment on the index finger bed area because these are, they look like they're twisted. So fix the QC and fix the machining on the on that piece and the rest of it will be golden. So those are my suggestions. If you choose to take them, great. If not, if you have any criticisms of my review, put it in the comments. If you think I haven't been fair to it, then let me know and we can discuss it further. Not that I'm that important, but I'll be one of the first reviews on YouTube for it and people will be looking at this. So I wish you good luck in your endeavors. Evolution Outdoors, the on their website that they're oh god i have a I have a cramp side stitch